It's Friday, November 1st, 2013. I'm Nikki Gordon Bloomfield, and this is episode number six of TEN, Transport Evolved News, for the week beginning October 28th, 2013. Published since 1936, Consumer Reports is known for its strict policies on editorial independence, complete impartiality, and lack of outside advertising. So when it says a product is good, it really means it. You may remember earlier this year that the folks at Consumer Reports burst into rapturous ecstasy when reviewing the Tesla all-electric Model S sedan, giving it a score of 99 out of 100, a score never before awarded in the magazine's 77-year-old history. But now, after collating its annual auto reliability rankings, Consumer Reports can add another accolade to Tesla's crown. It's so reliable that it's been awarded the coveted red tick recommendation. Interestingly, however, Consumer Reports notes that owners of the 2012 Tesla Model S seems to have less niggles than those with newer 2013 models. But since most of those niggles revolve around small things like noises, squeaks and rattles rather than anything bigger, Consumer Reports was still happy to award the Model S the highly prized recommendation. Of course, Consumer Reports also ranked every other car on sale in the US, including many other plugins. Thankfully, the Nissan Leaf and most other plugins on the market were awarded good scores for reliability. But Ford, whose entire range, save for its F-150 pickup with a 3.7 litre gas guzzling V8, scored below average. In fact, the worst score of the year was awarded to the Ford C-Max Energy, which Consumer Reports branded the most unreliable car of this year. Last week, we drove Volkswagen's XL1 plug-in diesel hybrid, the limited production, ultra-efficient two-seater with more than a touch of 2150 about it. At the time, we commented that its €111,000 price tag would make it little more than a collector's item, but perhaps we were a little too quick to judge. According to In Auto News, Volkswagen has already sold out of its planned 250-car production run for the futuristic XL1, months before it even manufactured the majority of those cars. With more customers than cars, you might think Volkswagen could be prompted to make more. But instead, the German automaker has said it will put all customers through a rigorous selection process, ultimately resulting in disappointed would-be buyers and some kind of perverted lottery system. Will Volkswagen eventually make more? Who can say? But the XL1 has certainly created a stir for a car with barely more than 50 horsepower of combined electric and gasoline oomph. As any EV driver will tell you, making a road trip of more than a few hundred miles is fairly tedious, especially if your only recharging chances come from slow overnight charging stations. But now Tesla Model S drivers in the US and Canada can travel the length of the Pacific West Coast from San Diego in the south to Vancouver in the north for free, using Tesla's recently completed West Coast Supercharger Corridor. Consisting of 16 supercharger stations, although we think you can make the trip by using about half of them, the West Coast Supercharger Corridor makes it possible to travel from north to south, or vice versa, stopping every 200 miles or so to recharge at Tesla's 120 kilowatt supercharger stations. Capable of refilling the Model S from empty to 50% full in 20 minutes or adding 200 miles of range in just 30, Tesla's superchargers are the fastest way to refuel an EV today. So it's no wonder that the two Tesla Model S cars which left on Wednesday morning this week from San Diego on Tesla's celebratory drive up the West Coast Supercharger Highway are already within spitting distance of Oregon. Meanwhile, on the East Coast, Tesla is rapidly opening parts of its East Coast Supercharger Corridor, linking Boston in the north to Miami in the south. Within a few months, Tesla says it'll even be possible to drive coast to coast in a Model S just using the supercharger network. Being married to an American, I've been promising myself I'd do a road trip across the US sometime soon, perhaps in an RV. But now the supercharger highway is connecting more and more of the US to free zero emissions motoring. I'm wondering if it'd be better to hire a Model S instead. What do you think? As the arrogant worms once put it, Canada's really big. And that's been a problem for many would-be leaf drivers north of the border who have wanted to get their hands on Nissan's all-electric hatchback. You see, until recently, Nissan wasn't sending that many Leafs to Canada, but Nissan has just confirmed it plans to increase Canadian Leaf production for 2014, as well as adding a few extra tweaks to the cars to make them more suited to life north of the 49th parallel. As with other 2014 Leafs around the world, the changes to the new model year aren't exactly large. There'll be a backup camera included as standard across the range, as well as an upgraded EV IT functionality with voice destination entry and SMS readout. Like the 2013 model year in Canada, the 2014s will also come with a 6.6 kilowatt onboard charger and quick charge port, both of which are options on the base model in the US, but are standard in the colder climates of Canada. Question, how many electric cars can Tesla make with 2 billion of the 18650 cells found in pretty much every laptop ever made? 
give up? Well, with about 7,000 cells in every Model S battery pack, that's about 285,700 cars. But why are we asking bizarre maths or math questions just before the weekend? Well, 2 billion cells is how many battery cells electronics giant Panasonic will be providing to Tesla in the coming four years after extending its existing supplier partnership with the Californian automaker earlier this week. Unlike most electric automakers who use custom-built high-capacity lithium-ion cells designed specifically for use in electric cars, Tesla chose to use the tiny-capacity consumer electronics battery cells to build high-performance, high-capacity battery packs for its cars because the tiny round cells are extremely versatile and relatively cheap to buy. With production goals of 40,000 cars by 2015, Tesla's extended deal with Panasonic not only means the automaker won't have to switch battery supplies in order to keep up with demand, but it will also be able to move on with plans to develop and produce the rest of the Tesla family. We're so eager to see them. And since we know someone will ask, no, you can't easily build a replacement Tesla-style electric battery pack from batteries salvaged from your laptop computer for your EV. Not only does Tesla's design use slightly modified versions of the 18650 form factor cells, but its battery management system, which is basically what makes sure the battery stays healthy and happy, isn't something most people can rustle up in their garage. Imagine the scenario. You're a Silicon Valley student who has a lovely blue Nissan Leaf, which by now is just a little bit more than common in the tech-obsessed hub of America. So, for a bit of a joke, perhaps after a night of just a little too much alcohol, you decided to remove all four doors on your lovely Nissan Leaf to turn it into a high-speed golf cart. Except, as your students and filled with curiosity, you decide to go a little bit further and take the driver's door apart to figure out what's inside. No sane person would do that, right? Yeah, they would. Enter Tom Courier, a Stanford student who decided with his friends to remove all four of his Leafs doors for the summer, planning to refit them in the fall when the weather got a little colder. But with the aforementioned driver's door still requiring a little TLC to get it back to as new condition, Courier's car can now be seen parked up on Palo Alto's main drag, El Camino Real, minus a door. Since the Bay Area weather doesn't get quite as cold or as wet as we have here in the UK, we can understand the desire to go doorless. And I've forgotten how many things I took apart when I was a student to figure out how they worked. Just not a $30,000 car. But Tom, we think next time it might be easier just to buy a convertible. Okay? Glad that's cleared up. Here at Transport Evolved, we hate parking our cars in big parking lots, especially if they're the sort of large city centre ones with barely enough room to get out of the car when you've actually parked it. Never fear though. Not to be outdone by Nissan on the self-driving car front, Honda has just demonstrated a network self-parking EV system at the Intelligent Transportation Systems World Congress in Tokyo, Japan. Using the rear view camera found as standard on the Honda Fit EV, or Jazz EV for some of us, the parking system also makes use of the CCTV cameras found in pretty much every parking lot we've ever seen to create a virtual map of the car using three-dimensional space. Using a two-way connection between the car and the parking lot, the EV is then silently and carefully guided into the parking space, as if by magic, without a driver at the wheel. As you'll see here, it's even possible to get the two EVs moving together in some kind of weird synchronised parking routine. It's all quite hypnotic. To give Honda its dues, this is the first time we've seen self-driving technology rely on external cameras to help keep costs down and to introduce an element of central control to proceedings. But we have to admit, it isn't quite as impressive as the self-driving Nissan Leaf Nissan CEO Carlos Ghosn demonstrated last month. Although, the idea of synchronised EV parking could be a new robo-game sport. Just saying. Months. And yes, we do mean months. After owners started to report that their Focus electric cars would randomly tell them to stop safely now after losing all drive power, Ford has begun an official recall to fix the problem. First reported more than 14 months ago, the National Highway Safety Traffic Administration began an official investigation into the problem seven weeks ago, after 12 drivers complained about the problem and Ford's lack of remedy. As 11 of those complaints said the issue occurred while the car was in motion, we're guessing that particular call between Ford and the NHSTA wasn't all that fun. Anyway, thanks to Ford's lacklustre attitude to EVs in general, just over 2,000 cars are thought to be affected by the recall, which Ford primes dealers for yesterday. An official recall notice is expected any day, so if you do own a Ford Focus Electric, expect a letter through the post very shortly. That's 
it for this week. Don't forget to join us next week for another episode of TEN. And in the meantime, visit www.transportevolve.com for all the EV news that's fit to print. Subscribe to our channel and other shows on YouTube and join us live on Sunday when we'll be discussing these stories and others on Transport Evolved. I'm Nikki Gordon-Bloomfield and until next time, stay juiced up.